Yo, what is going on, everyone? My name is Nick, or The Notorious Fantasy, and in today's video, we're going to be going in-depth into my week number six wide receiver start or sit decisions for the 2023 fantasy football season. We're going to be talking through every single game from Thursday night football all the way until Monday night football, and I'll be telling you guys whether I would start or sit the wide receivers in all of those games. But before we could get into things, I would like to ask that if you guys are new to the channel and you do end up enjoying today's video, that you please make sure to hit that subscribe button down below. And while you're down there, whether you are new to the channel or not, please make sure you leave a like on today's video. It would help me out a ton if you want to follow me on Twitter or X, please do so at NotoriousFNTSY. And if you'd like access to my weekly rankings, as well as getting an answer to any of the questions you guys may have, make sure to check out the Patreon link in the video description for $7.50 a month. So without further ado, let's get into my week number six wide receiver start or sit decision. We begin with Thursday Night Football, the Denver Broncos at the Kansas City Chiefs. Now, in this matchup, I don't like a single wide receiver for fantasy football this week. When it comes to the Kansas City Chiefs, their only reliable target that you can trust every single week is Travis Kelsey. Rashi Rice feels like the number one target in terms of the wide receiver core, but Mahomes spreads the ball out so much every single game that you shouldn't be confident in the slightest starting any of them. Now, if you had to play one of them right, your team is down bad. Maybe you're dealing with some players on by, right? Maybe you got some guys on the Packers or on the Steelers. Then sure, I guess Rashi Rice would be the answer, but ultimately, on a majority of teams, Rashi Rice should be on the bench. Sky Moore is down to two targets a week over the last two, so obviously we are going to sit him down, and Kadarius Tony has yet to score any touchdowns this season, which severely hurts his upside, and he's not even getting as many carries as I honestly expected he would with how much Andy Reid likes to use him as a quote-unquote gadget player. For the Denver Broncos, Jerry Judy did end up looking pretty decent against the Jets, but Russ looks bad against good defenses. Russ almost pulled the wool over our eyes over the first couple weeks of the season because the Broncos never really played up against a great defense. Once they played up against the Jets, we saw Russell Wilson get into the fetal position, fumbling the ball every five fucking seconds. Ultimately, I get the Kansas City Chiefs aren't some world-beating defense in the National Football League, but at the end of the day, I do not feel any confidence in starting Jerry Judy this week. Cortland Sutton, to me, still feels like the number one receiver in targets weekly. But like I said with Judy, this is a bad matchup for this offense. Marvin Mims is a guy that I talk about every single week, basically getting on my knees, begging Sean Payton to give this man more snaps. Does while it might still be tough to figure out when to start him for fantasy, the upside would be immense if they would just let him play more. And they don't. They're not going to this week. Maybe one day Sean Payton will figure it out. Moving next to London, the Baltimore Ravens at the Late Titans. In this one, I am going to be starting up Zay Flowers. Now, none of the other wide receivers on this team appear to be able to actually catch the fucking ball. So, Zay Flowers is a guy that I'm firing up with confidence. Now, I will note that he is pretty boom or bust weekly. It's not like you throw Zay Flowers into your lineup and he's locked and loaded as like a top 24 guy every single week. There's going to be games where he's the wide receiver 40, but he also has the upside to be a top 12 wide receiver weekly. The Tennessee Titans defense is terrible up against the pass, so I do think this could be a very good game out of Zay Flowers. Now, the other receivers on the Ravens, they've got Rashad Master Bateman, who hasn't gotten over three targets in a single game this season. It appears that Rashad Bateman is in a slump. And to be honest with you, based upon how he's looked in these games, I don't know if he's going to be like Taylor Swift and be able to shake it off, right? This guy has just looked like shit. I was a big Rashad Bateman truther this fantasy offseason, and man, has he made me look like an idiot. They also got Nelson Aguilar. With how bad Bateman is, Aguilar is actually set up to get a decent amount of targets. With that said, though, he's Nelson Aguilar. He's going to have these games where it's like, oh, maybe Nelson Aguilar is back. And then the next week, slap you across the face and have a shit game. So I'm definitely not starting Nelson Aguilar. For the Tennessee Titans, DeAndre Hopkins last week had his first week where the offense truly fed DeAndre Hopkins, right? This man had 11 targets against the Colts for eight receptions with 140 yards. I still believe that DeAndre Hopkins is a pretty safe bet weekly, but we all know that His upside is limited by the fact that the Titans just love to run the ball and by the fact that Ryan Tannehill looks pretty meh 
this season. I wouldn't say Ryan Tannehill looks like a complete and utter unmitigated disaster, but I would also say that Ryan Tannehill doesn't look like the quarterback that he was a couple of years ago. Ultimately, the fact that this game in London does definitely throw a bit of a wrench into things, even though I feel pretty confident with D-Hop, right? Pretty confident in him week in and week out. We know crazy shit happens in London. Now we move to the beginning of the real Sunday slate. The Washington left hands up. Who are we? The Commanders at the Atlanta Falcons in hot Atlanta. Now Terry McLaurin's usage last week had me awestruck, right? I was completely shook the whole entire fucking game, right? You're seeing Curtis Samuel get fed like a fat kid at Thanksgiving and Terry McLaurin was out there he didn't even get his first serving, right? He just had some fucking appetizers, right? He wasn't getting the ball at all. And I was sitting there just so confused because they are going up against the Bears last week, right? The Bears have one of the worst defenses in the NFL. There are really bad teams in the NFL that would kick the teeth in of the Chicago Bears defense. So when you have a guy like Terry McLaurin, I get Terry McLaurin, might not be as good as a lot of people think he is, but he's still a number one receiver in the NFL on a lot of teams, and yet he just didn't get the targets. Now, I assume he bounces back here against the Falcons. I assume the targets start to come his way because if they don't, even in fine matchups like up against the Atlanta Falcons, Terry McLaurin is going to start to be a player that moves from the start category weekly into being a sit. Now, Jahan Dotson, even with McLaurin, for some reason, not getting the ball and all the targets going to Curtis Samuel last week, he has only cracked the top 32 wide receivers once this season. Now, I liked Jahan Dotson a ton in the offseason, right? Jahan Dotson was a first-round NFL draft pick in 2022. This guy showed some skill. He flashed in a couple of games. And this year, it's like he's not even in the offense. He's been fucking invisible like his name was John Cena. So I'm not starting him. Curtis Samuel has had back-to-back weeks inside the top 14 at wide receiver and has scored a touchdown in back-to-back games. I don't trust him at all. I don't trust him at all because we've seen Curtis Samuel do this before where he has like two good games in a row, right? And then after that, it's just five weeks of virtually nothing. But I will note, that he is close to being a start because when you put up those kind of numbers two weeks in a row, it is hard to not acknowledge him. For the Atlanta Falcons, they have finally started to use Drizzy Drake London and Kyle Pitts. Drake London has seen seven or more targets in back-to-back Michael Jordan 96-97 weeks. Now, it seems like the Falcons are actually committed to giving Drake London more targets. So while it does still feel a little bit gross to throw Drizzy Drake London in your lineup because Desmond Ritter is an absolute trash can of a quarterback, the matchup is too good to be disputed this week up against the Commanders. The Atlanta Falcons did trade for Van Jefferson with the LA Rams doing a 2025 pick swap of late round picks. I would assume since the trade went by or went through today on Tuesday, that Van Jefferson will see some mild usage on the team. I don't think he's going to go out there and play 80% of the snaps. Maybe he gets a couple of snaps. And maybe if this Atlanta Falcons offense starts figuring things out, throwing the ball more, maybe in super plus matchups, you can start Van Jefferson due to his speed. But ultimately, this week, with him just showing up there, it's not even a guarantee that he plays. Matt Collins hasn't done shit all season, so you are obviously not going to be starting him. And next up, we move to the cold like Minnesota Vikings at the Chicago Bears. Sadly, the Minnesota Vikings have placed Justin Jefferson on the IR. Now, I try not to be super dramatic, but what I will tell you is that if the Minnesota Vikings keep losing football games like they have been all season, there is virtually no reason for the Minnesota Vikings to rush Justin Jefferson back. And if I'm being honest with you, if this is a dagger in the heart of the season, if you get bent over a table by the Chicago Bears, then there is starting to be doubt for me that Jefferson will return in a strong way this season. Now, again, don't overreact. Maybe I'm overreacting, 
but that is something that I'm kind of worried about as someone that has Justin Jefferson on a fantasy squad. Now, Jordan Addison, without Jefferson, you just have to believe that Addison will see an uptick in targets. Last week, he had nine targets for six receptions on 64 yards with a touchdown. Start Addison to me with supreme confidence up against a dust, a dick cheese Chicago Bears defense. Now, K.J. Osborne still has brick for hands, right? He's permanently doing that thing that kids do in college where they do the Edward 40 hands, right, where you tape two 40s to your hand. You're drinking them all night long, right? Very funny. Osborne has fucking 40s stuck to his hand, his hands permanently. This man will be butt naked, wide open for a 60-yard bomb from Kirk Thuggins, Kirk O'Chains, and he'll drop it. But without Jefferson, he's going to get his five receptions on nine targets last week for 49 yards against the Chiefs. I do feel more confident in Addison because I think Addison's a better player. But if we're calling a spade a spade with what I've heard from the Vikings... It seems like they want Osborne to be the number one target. But again, even if he's the number one target, Jordan Addison could easily outscore him because Jordan Addison's actually a pretty good receiver and Osborne is pretty just meh. The other receiver on that team would be Brandon Powell, appears to be the clear number three receiver on the Vikings without Jettas. Wide receiver 40 last week, but we expect him to go back down to earth, right? We're not going to expect Brandon Powell to go nuclear again as a top 40 wide receiver, even up against, again, a shit tear Bears defense, a shit tear, shit tier Bears defense, sorry about, sorry, sorry about that, DJ Moore, wiki wiki, he's back, top five wide receiver in back-to-back games, five touchdowns in the last three games, the Bears might be back, now, I'm not saying the Bears are guaranteed back, but I know what I will tell you here, Feller, is that going up against That Minnesota Vikings defense, this should be a dominating performance by Wiki Wiki DJ Moore. This is one of those where you go to sleep, you wake up in the morning if you're DJ Moore, Sunday morning before the game, and you have soiled the sheets because it was a wet dream, man. This is a great matchup. Jefferson looks good. DJ Moore's balling. This is Exactly what I thought the Bears would be to start off the season. Now, I'm not getting overzealous here telling you guys the Bears are fully back, right? The Bears are going to do this, that, and the other thing. But hey, up against the Vikings, DJ Moore should be balling. Darnell, here comes the Mooney, has seen four or fewer targets over the last four games. Now, even with Claypool gone, he's been like a healthy scratch the last couple of weeks. There really is no hope that Mooney ends up being a reliable player. Could he pull a rabbit out of the hat this week against the Vikings and have a good game? Yeah, But ultimately, I'm sitting him. Equimenia St. Brown, you can argue for him or Tyler Scott to be the number three receiver without Chase Claypool. With that said, though, you can't start a wide receiver three on the Chicago Bears. Next up, we move to the Seattle Seahawks at the Cincinnati Bengals. If you guys have enjoyed this video thus far, make sure you hit that like button as well as hit that subscribe button down below. It does help me out a ton. If you've got any questions, leave them in the comment section. So Seahawks versus the Bengals. The Bengals are another team where, again, I don't want to overreact. I don't want to give Joe Burrow the gawk gawk 9,000, the dick sucky sucky special. But what I will tell you, even though it was against the Cardinals, Joe Burrow was moving with, he just was moving better. I don't know how to describe it. Like, in other weeks, it looked like he was stuck in molasses, right? If the defense was coming at him, if the offensive line folded like a table that the drunk Bills fans jumped through, then... Man, oh man, was Joe Burrow just fucked, right? He wasn't able to move. He wasn't able to maneuver out of the pocket, make those out-of-structure throws that we're used to with Joe Burrow. Last week, he looked better. Now, again, it might just be that the Cardinals' defense is dust. Yes, that could play a factor, but it's not like the Seattle Seahawks have the most elite defense ever in the National Football League. Now, Jamar Chase went nuclear. He went off last week. He went fucking crazy. He said after that last performance for the Bengals, not last week, but the week prior, that he's always open, he wants the ball more, he's talking about how he's fucking Waffle House 7-Eleven, and after this game, he posted a picture on Twitter of 7-Eleven, because they're always open, 15 receptions for 192 yards, and three touchdowns. Probably not doing that again against the Seahawks, but he could easily be the wide receiver one on the week. I know we started to panic about the Bengals, and I'm not even ready to say the Bengals are fully back, they're going to be this team competing for the AFC Championship, which could very well be possible 
right? I'm not here to get fucking overjoyed about a game where you beat down on the Cardinals defense, but hey, I'm definitely starting Jamar Chase. We were starting Jamar Chase last week as well. For the Seahawks, DK Metcalf is a must-start every single week. He's been pretty up and down this season, but he hasn't really been down bad, where I'm saying, like, in prior years, Metcalf will be very hot and cold, icy hot, like a fucking Shaquille O'Neal ad, right, where he has these great games, but then his bad games, he's like the wide receiver 60, right, wide receiver 50, where it's like, oh shit, if you started him, he really sunk your team's ship. But this season, he's been up and down, but his bad games, he's like the wide receiver 35, so it doesn't hurt like a butt cheek on a stick. He should have a solid game this week. This could be a high-scoring tit-for-tat back and forth affair. Though I will note that Tyler Lockett's been silent like the night where Santa Claus comes, and eventually he's going to break that, right? He had that huge game against Detroit, but outside of that, he's been pretty bad. He is much more boom or bust compared to Metcalf. I'm definitely going to start him here due to the high-scoring upside, but again, I understand why some people might be tired of Lockett's bullshit, but when you drafted Lockett, you kind of had to know that this was going to be the scenario. It was the same thing with Metcalf. We already kind of knew this going into the season. Jackson Smith and Najigba, I can't comprehend at all why this team doesn't get him more targets. I don't get it. Drafted him in the first round. Everyone in the draft process, me included, was getting down on their knees for Jackson Smith and the Jigba. This guy is the best wide receiver prospect in this draft class out of The Ohio State University. And he doesn't look like it. Doesn't look like it. Puka is the best rookie, but still have hope that eventually JSN is going to be great. But right now he's left, he's got to be left on the bench. Next up, we got Tyler. Yeah, Boyd as a sit, even without potentially T Higgins in this game. And last week there was no Higgins. Boyd wasn't targeted heavily. Deep down the field, he got a decent amount of targets, but they weren't very deep. I'm going to be honest with you, I just don't trust Boyd. Trenton Irwin, fucking nerd-ass name, wide receiver 22 last week. This is the type of guy that Brady would throw three touchdowns to in the playoffs in the old Patriots days, baby. Fucking Chris Hogan 2.0, wide receiver 22 last week, but we don't expect him to do that yet, A. Eh? Again, next up, we move to the sixth game on the slate, the San Francisco 49ers at the Cleveland Browns. I just got my sixth sense about me that says, you know what? We need to give a quick word from our friends and our sponsor over at Underdog Fantasy. Underdog Fantasy is the best place to play NFL Pick'em in the whole entire universe, and they have a great offer for you guys today that we'll be talking about in just a couple of seconds. If you are new to NFL Pick'em on Underdog, I will explain it to you guys. It is incredibly simple. All you got to do is pick at least two pieces here for your Pick'em slip. We have Russell Wilson, Higher than half of an interception on Thursday Night Football up against the Chiefs. I think he's going to throw a pick in this one. And then for our other pick, we are going to go with Isaiah Pacheco. Higher than half a rushing or receiving touchdown. If both of these picks hit, we'll get three times our entry fee. If you do three picks and they all hit, it'll be six times. Four picks is ten times. And five picks is twenty times your entry fee. Now, if you guys are new to Underdog Fantasy and click on the link in the video description or use promo code Notorious, you must live in one of these states on your screen right now. You will get a first match deposit bonus of up to $100. If you deposit $100, they give an additional $100, $50, an additional $50, $25, an additional $25. The minimum deposit on Underdog is $10. And if you have a gambling problem, please make sure that you call 1-800-GAMBLER. Back on into things, the 49ers at the Cleveland Browns. Brandon Ayuk weekly feels safer, in my opinion. He's safer bet weekly compared to Debo. Down game last week, but even in a tougher matchup against the Browns defense, right? I don't think the Browns defense is some pushover. You're definitely starting Ayuk with a ton of confidence, right? Big cock Brock Purdy. Looks like he could win the MVP. Now, I know people are going to be like, Nick, don't you know that, uh, don't you know? Sound like a fucking Canadian. Don't you know that um, Brock Purdy's a system quarterback? Miss me with that bullshit, man. Trey Lance couldn't perform in this offense. There's a lot of quarterbacks that aren't very good that would not be able to perform in this system. I get he gets an assist by the fact that they have Kittle, Ayuk, and Debo Samuel, and Christian McCaffrey. What is he supposed to do? Not throw them the ball and throw it to fucking Jawan Jennings or Ronnie Bell every single game? No. Brandon Ayuk, again, we're starting him. Don't even have to think twice about it, even in a tougher matchup. Debo was a decoy in week four. Week five, he ramped up his production, just like Ayuk, even in a tougher matchup. With how good this 49ers offense is, you have to play Debo Samuel, right? You don't, need, you don't even have to, if you're, 
you have Debo or Ayuk on your team, I don't know why I just had a fucking brain fart right there. You already knew to start, right? You didn't need this fucking video, even against the Browns defense. You fire these two up with just a crazy amount of confidence. Juan Jennings, arguably the wide receiver three on the team. You could argue it's Ronnie Bell. One of these guys is going to have one of those games where he catches like two passes, has like 120 yards and a touchdown, but you're never going to really know when to start him. Now, the Browns are potentially dealing with another absence of Deshaun Watson. Prior to the bye that they had last week, they played the Ravens. And Amari Cooper was terrible, not because Amari Cooper is a bad receiver, but because Watson was not playing. Rumors are that Watson isn't a lock to play on Sunday. And if he does miss, even with how good Amari Cooper is, you cannot start Amari Cooper. Elijah Moore feels like he was on the come up prior to the Watson injury. But even if Watson plays, this matchup does scream stay away. So I'm sitting Elijah Moore against the Niners. And again, Amari Cooper... If he does play with Sean Watson, while Amari Cooper has been so good, obviously you have to bump him down the rankings. He's not like a must-start candidate this week because of the matchup. DPJ, Donovan Peoples-Jones, if you you can't start Elijah Moore, who is actually used in the offensive scheme, cannot be starting Donovan Peoples-Jones. Next up, we move to my favorite game of the week as a Dolphins fan, the Carolina Panthers at the Miami Dolphins. Adam Thielen has had four straight games inside of the top 20, two of those four games inside of the top five. Dolphins defense is weak. So this is great. Now, I will note that I was a bit of an Adam Thielen truther in the offseason. Now, I'll be honest with you, I casted a wide range on the Panthers. I said, you know what? If you're in five different drafts, just draft a different Panthers wide receiver in all of those drafts at the end. Because I believed that one of them was going to hit. And it turns out Adam Thielen is batting fucking 400 right now. This dude is like Barry fucking Bonds hitting it out of the park every single time. Look, I get that Adam Thielen's getting up there in age. I get Adam Thielen doesn't look like the Adam Thielen from a couple of years ago in Minnesota. That was honestly one of the better receivers in the NFL. I get that. And I get that Bryce Young, the short king himself, the guy who needs to get on a step stool to brush his teeth in the morning, doesn't look amazing. And CJ Stroud looks better. Richardson looks better. But when push comes to shove, you're not fucking sitting a guy that continues to have two of those last four games where he's been a top 20 guy, which is very reliable been a top five wide receiver and again the Dolphins defense made improvements they look better against the Giants I think they're gonna look good against the Panthers but Thielen's still gonna have many opportunities where he's just fucking wide open so definitely starting out of Thielen the other receiver is DJ Chark baby Chark had a solid game last week up against the Detroit Lions I would definitely say at this point it feels like Chark's the number two guy but I still can't start him even against the Dolphins because of how spotty Bryce Young is. Bryce Young turns into fucking Mahomes when he's throwing the ball to Adam Thielen, but when it's going to, like, DJ Chark or Jonathan Mingo, it's not as good. Mingo continues to get targeted by Young, but again, we can't really be starting these ancillary options on the Panthers. For the Dolphins, Tyreek is in a wet dream matchup. I'm just salivating thinking about Tyreek. Taking the Panthers to pound town here. He could easily be the number one receiver on the week. Allegedly, Tyreek Hill, according to Tyreek Hill, tweeted that he's been fined a- over a hundred grand for his last week's game. I don't know why they fined him that much money. Was it because he jumped into the crowd and tried to give his mom the football? The NFL is a soft league, man. The no fun league, as they call it. Jalen waddled away, waddle waddle finally showed up last week, right? He finally came back. Should be able to do it again against the Panthers. I'm slightly starting to worry more about Waddle than I did in the offseason, but again, I'm not jumping ship because this Dolphins offense is a fucking rocket straight to the moon. Braxton Berrios, the Dolphins use far too many wide receivers to start the quote-unquote wide receiver three there. They still have said they have Ozen Anderson, the chosen one. And we may even see some more Claypool this week, who's rumored to start at tight end. I don't think he's going to be tight end eligible, though, on a majority of fantasy websites. So even if you're trying to get a little bit cheeky, a little sneaky, sneaky, pick up Claypool. I don't know if the websites will actually list him as a tight end. Next up, we got the Indianapolis Colts at the Jacksonville Jaguars. The Jaguars have officially fucking taken that rust off of them, right? Like when that one dude had to get the... I forget what it's called in Game of Thrones. You know what I'm talking about? Where the guy in prison had to get 
the look like fish gut, not fish guts, like the fish gills were on you. You know what I'm talking about? That show was so much. Sir Jorah did it. His name was the guy that really wanted to fuck the Khaleesi the whole show. If you watch Game of Thrones, you're probably like, Nick, you fucking idiot. I watched Game of Thrones. I'm a Game of Thrones guy. But man, oh man, that like last season being so bad really kind of painted my memory of it. And I kind of forgot. Grayscale is what it was called. I know there's already someone in the comments like, Nick, you fucking idiot. You don't remember what it was called? Grayscale. The fat dude. Aaron around the uh, poop all the time was there in that scene as well. If you know, you know. Nick, how do you not remember his name as well? It is what it is, right? My memory, I have a lot of shit in my mind. Most of it is random references to make for the videos, and the rest of it is all about fantasy football. So the Jags shook it off, Taylor Swift style. Nick, you already made that joke once, I know. So Calvin really had a huge bounce back week as the wide receiver nine against a stout Bills defense. I am still very confident in Ridley, though, even through the trials and tribulations of this season. Still a Calvin Ridley truther. Christian Kirk has been reliable even when Calvin Ridley wasn't. So we're still going to continue to throw Kirk out there. I know week one, kind of a down game. But outside of that, those last four games, he's been pretty good. Fired up, him up with some confidence. Then they also have Zay Jones. And Zay Jones even found a way into the end zone last week against the Bills. But with how good Christian Kirk has looked and with the fact that we all know Calvin Ridley is still pretty good, Zay Jones is kind of the odd man out here, even up against a pretty middling Colts defense. Michael Pittman has had two downish games in a row, the wide receiver 33 last week. With Gardner Minshew under center, the upside feels a little bit lower. But again, it's not like this is the Saxonville Jaguars defense. So Pittman still gets enough volume to be fine. Josh Downs, it really does seem like Gardner likes feeding Downs the rock. If the matchup was better, if this was like a, you know, a Raiders defense or a worse defense, then yeah, I'd be like, you know what? Start Josh Downs. He's close to being a start. I'll be honest with you. He's like the guy in Home Improvement. I think his name was Wilson, where his head was just like, barely going over the fence, right? This guy, Josh Downs' head is just barely below the fence, right? He's very close to being a start-worthy guy. Alec Pierce just isn't involved. I don't even think we need to waste any breath talking about him. Next up, we got the New Orleans Saints at the Houston Texans. Now, Chris Olave was silent in a dominating performance, right? 50 Shades of Grey style fucking whips and chains. Hence the Patriots, right? A shellacking. The Patriots didn't even score. Olave didn't do too much. Are we panicking about one down game for Olave? No, I will note that Derek Carr does not look great. That does slightly worry me. Texans defense is pretty average, so we're still starting Chris Olave, though. So don't panic just yet on him. Michael Thomas hasn't scored a touchdown all year. He continues to look solid on the field, but he's yet to really have a big fantasy performance, right? It's not like back in the day where even if Thomas didn't score, he was getting like 10 fucking slant catches a game and was still very fantasy relevant. That's just not the case this year. I'm Shahid. Rashid Shahid has huge weekly upside, right? He has that 30-point game, that maybe even 40-point game in him, right? But his floor is the basement, right? He's back in the basement like Ron Stewart. So sit down, Rashid Shahid. For the Texans, Tank Dell's in the concussion protocol. Might play, might not play. It seems like the concussions this year, if you get a concussion, you're out for a week. Again, there are different scenarios, right? You miss, you get a concussion Thursday, you might be able to play Sunday, right? But if it was Sunday, then Sunday, it seems a lot more unlikely. That should allow Collins to be a little bit more of a safer bet. Wasn't amazing last week. Not a great matchup, but C.J. Stroud has been looking so good that you still got to be dialing up Nico Collins again. Not as like a top 15 option or something, but definitely has top 20 upside. Roberto Woods, Bobby Trees will be seeing more targets if Dell doesn't play. But against the Saints defense, I would sit him if Tank plays this week. Even with the amount of upside that he has, and he has looked really good this season, I'll give him a lot of credit. But again, against the Saints defense, he feels like a clear sit. Next up, we move to the New England Patriots at the Las Vegas Raiders. Devontae Adams had a down game. I know there's going to be people weeping. Oh my God, Nick, I needed Devontae Adams to get me 14 points and he didn't do it, Nick. He, he fell down on the one or two yard line and then Jacobs ran it in. Nick, do we need to worry about Devontae Adams? No. Oh. Do not panic about Devontae Adams. The Patriots defense is bottom of the shelf, bottom of the barrel, straight up dog shit. 
do not panic about Devontae Adams. Jacoby Myers of the Raiders. Huge game last week against the Packers. Seven catches for 75 yards. Round of applause and a tug. Love him this week against the Patriots. I love him. Uh, Hunter Renfro, did he fuck Josh McDaniel's wife or something? Because he has not been getting the ball. There's been rumors that he's going to get traded, but there's been rumors for weeks about that and nothing has happened. Kendrick Bourne, this Patriots offense sucks so bad that I'm not starting any of these guys. Bourne, Parker, Juju Smith-Schuster, Corvette, Corvette. We're not, again, we're just not wasting our breath talking about these guys. Mac Jones is so bad. There's rumors that the Zappinator, Bailey Zappi might go. This is just terrible. Uh, next up, we got the Arizona Cardinals at the LA Rams. Cooper Cup, Puka Nakua formed an Eiffel Tower over that Eagles defense. Problem is, it wasn't enough to win the game, but they both looked good. Cooper Cup had his first game back. I was a little bit worried about Cooper Cup in his first game back. Like, there were so many reports last week about how they wanted him to feel 80 to 90%. They didn't feel like he was there. He looked fucking 110%, though, when he came back. He was looking really good. The Breakfast Club. It appears that Puka's also in the Breakfast Club. So that Breakfast Club, Koopa, Koopa Troopa, Cooper, Cup, Puka Nakua, must starts every single week. And this Cardinals defense, man, oh, man, they are bad. So Cooper Cup, Puka Nakua should be in for big spots here. I know people were all hot and bothered with Cup coming back. They're like, oh, my God, should we trade uh, Puka Nakua? Should we cut him, Nick? I don't think I can start him. People were so worried, man. And I told you guys, do not worry. You don't get that many targets through the first couple weeks of the season. I get Cooper Cup's the guy, right? I'm not trying to say Puka's taking over for Cooper Cup, but he's still going to get a lot of targets, and we saw exactly that. He was a top 12 receiver last week. You should be starting them both without even thinking about it. Tutu Atwell has been thrown into the cuck chair. He scored last week, but it is very clear, crystal clear, 2020 vision that with Cup and Puka playing, you cannot start out well. He's going to be getting phased out. He's going to be getting snapped out of the offense, Thanos style. Hollywood Brown has been a top 24 receiver for the Cardinals in four straight weeks, even with Dobbs having a disaster class against the Bengals last week. Hollywood Brown was still eating. A fat kid who loves cake, baby. Hollywood Brown. I've been shocked with how good this offense has looked, and even without James Conner, who's now in the IR, even with Amari DiMarcado, the Italian Stallion running back, we're still starting Hollywood Brown. Michael Wilson had a great game in week four, struggled last week, but Dobbs also struggled, so we saw less Wilson. I think at some point this season, he could actually become a weekly starter, but I don't trust him enough for that right now. Rondell Moore looked good last week against the Bengals, but again, I don't think you can really feel very confident in a gadget player like Rondell Moore weekly, especially up against a Rams defense. Again, this this isn't some world-beating Rams defense, right? But they're also not terrible. Next up, we got the Philadelphia Eagles at the New York Jumbo Jets. A.J. Brown has been a top 13 receiver in three straight games. This is not the best matchup, obviously, up against Sauce Godna, who... Might be seriously hurt. I I haven't really seen anything about that. But the Jets, even without sauce, they're still a good defense. Certainly aren't sitting a guy, though, who has gotten over 120 yards in three straight games. We've seen that this Eagles offense is pretty hot and cold with the receivers, right? When A.J. Brown's lighten it up, Devontae Smith is kind of sleepy, right? Not having the best games. But again, you're never sitting either of them because the upside is just so strong. Devontae Smith has had a few downer weeks in a row. But I'm still not worried, though. Really, no need to on him. Olamide Zakaias, another one of those guys that just randomly, like, you'll you'll wake, maybe you fall asleep during the games. You'll wake up, it's like week eight, and maybe you drank a little too much, or you ate too much food, you're in like a fucking food coma, you open your eyes, and Scott Hansen's like, and the second touchdown of the day by Olamide Zakaias, 120 yards, two catches, two touchdowns, right? You're like, oh, that's going to happen every once in a while but never reliable enough to actually start him. Garrett Wilson. Wilson. Zach Wilson put up one good game, and everyone's like, oh, my God, is Zach Wilson back? Oh, my God. And then, obviously, Zach Wilson sucks against the Broncos, and Zach Wilson's just bad. So, in good matchups, sure, start Garrett Wilson, but the Eagles defense, even though they've been stressed like a damsel this season, I still don't really think you can start Garrett Wilson. Alan Lazard. Uh, If you can't start Wilson, you're definitely not starting Lazard. And then Randall Cobb, yikes, it seems like they're trying to trade McCole Hardman. But uh, yeah, really nothing you want to do with any of these Jets receivers. Next up, we got the Detroit Lions at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. 
Josh Reynolds for the Lions. If Amon Ross St. Brown doesn't suit up, we should see Reynolds uh, looking pretty like the other Reynolds having a decent game against the Bucks. Wide receiver 16 last week against the Panthers. Should have a decent game again if he is the guy. Now, I know Amon Ross St. Brown isn't listed on the screen, but if Amon Ross St. Brown starts you, obviously starting him, and that would demote Josh Reynolds into being a sit. Khalif Raymond is going to have, maybe even this will be his good game, should operate as the second target in the wide receiver corp. Seems like Sam Laporta is the number two target, but Khalif will be the number two target at the receiver position. But he's behind Reynolds, even without St. Brown. And then Jamison Williams, this team is still ramping him up. I think at some point this season, he will be start-worthy. He's an incredibly fast wide receiver, Speedy Gonzalez. So eventually, he will be a start-worthy guy, I think. But right now, as the team's ramping him up, you definitely can't roll him out there. For the Bucks. Mike Evans had a down game prior to their bye week last week against the Saints. Anyone with half of a brain saw that coming, though. We know Lattimore versus Evans is. Always a tough spot for Mike Evans. Chris Godwin finally showed up in Evans' kind of down game against the Saints. But I'm being honest with you, I'm still not super confident in Godwin. He's going to continue to perform from an NFL standpoint, right? He's open, catches the ball, but he doesn't get enough targets or touchdowns to be a guy that I'm uber confident in, especially since this Lions defense has looked better. So again, I'm not telling you to sit Chris Godwin, but I'm just telling you, like, be a little bit cautious, right? I don't think he's going to have as big of a game as he had in his last game against the Saints. And then Trey Palmer is a guy that looks good out there, but with Evans and Godwin being healthy, knock on wood, we don't root for injuries, you're never going to be able to start Trey Palmer. Next up, we move to, because he waited all day for Sunday night, the New York football Giants at the Buffalo Bills, the Giants on prime time for like the eighth week in a row, and there's only been six weeks of the season. Why are the Giants on prime time again? Oh my god. Why the fuck is the NFL doing this to us again? Why? I don't want to go on a rant here, but this sucks. I think they could have flexed this game out and they didn't do it. This is bad. Uh, the Giants, Juan Dale, missed the end of the game against the Dolphins with an injury. Keeps getting fed, but the Giants offense is too bad to start him. Darius Slayton, if you can't start the number one target, you can't start the number two target. And then Jalen Hyatt, this man is invisible, doing his John Cena impression. You can't fucking see him. For the Bills, Stefan Diggs, top six wide receiver in back-to-back weeks. Easily a smash this week against the Giants. You don't even have to think twice about it. Gabe Davis, top 24 receiver in back-to-back weeks. One touchdown in four straight games. Hit the shillest celebration uh, when he scored that touchdown against my Dolphins. Fuck you for doing that, but I love Shane Gillis, so it's okay. Guys, don't watch Shane Gillis. That dude is fucking hilarious. Not as funny as me, of course. Obviously, the guy's funnier than me. He's hilarious. His Netflix special is amazing. If you haven't seen it, watch it. No free ads, though. Got an underdog. Pretty reliable this week, though, up against the Giants. So I like Gabe Davis. Deontay Hardy is like one of those guys. It's kind of like the Dolphins where they just have like a million guys that are the number three receiver. Hardy looked good last week, but even in this wet dream matchup against the Giants, you're not going to start him because of how much competition is around. Final game here, the Dallas Cowboys at the LA Superchargers. Dallas put up a stinker. You could smell them through the screen. Smelled like a heaping pile of shit. Eddie Lamb has been as a whole very disappointing this season. Should be a closer game, though, with higher scoring upside this week, so I think he bounces back, even though Dak looks atrocious. Michael Gallup appears to be the number two on the team ahead of Brandon Cooks, but with how Dak has looked, I would sit him, even in a good matchup. And Brandon Cooks just doesn't get the ball, so I'm Him, for the Chargers here, we got two receivers that I want to start. Now, Keenan Allen, I'm very confident in. Four touchdowns over the last three games. I know he disappointed up against a poor Raiders defense, but we're not panicking, right? We're still starting him weekly even against a quote-unquote tougher Cowboys defense. Joshua Palmer is not in the most ideal matchup, obviously, but with how many targets he gets, he's a fringe start right now. They're coming out the bye, so I hope as a football fan that we see more Quentin Johnston, but Brandon Staley's a buffoon, so we probably won't, even though they're coming out the bye week. So start, start, start. Uh, Keenan Allen with supreme confidence. Start Joshua Palmer slightly, right? If you're in a bad situation, you can start him. But have a big game because he gets targeted so heavily. But again, I know the Cowboys defense looked like shit against the, the 49ers, but I don't really expect them to be that bad against the Chargers. So Palmer's like a fringe start. Keen Allen's a must start. CeeDee Lamb, he's still a must start too, even though I'm starting to worry if I'm being honest with you. 
And then Quint Johnson's a sit because, again, the team doesn't give him enough touches. So thank you guys all so much for watching. If you did end up enjoying today's video, make sure you hit that subscribe button down below, as well as hitting that like button. It would help me out a ton if you want to follow me on Twitter or X. Please do so at NotoriousFNTSY. If you want to check out my Patreon, please do link in the video description for $7.50 a month. Love you guys all so much. Hope you have a great day. And as always, good.